Um, welcome everyone and welcome to the kickoff public art discussion series of 2012 and 2013. Um, if you have any questions about the space here, it is Harvard's collaborative creative art center where they bring students and faculty and visiting artists together to um, experiment and work in interdisciplinary arts. And Bess Palpeck is the program's manager. Bess, you want to wave to everyone? <laughs> and so we're so happy to have you here. The format of the event, we are going to have <coughs> 10 presentations. Each one is going to be three minutes, kind of like speed dating your public artist. And it's supposed to give you a layout of what's going on today, because these are projects that have happened in the past year in um, Greater Boston and New England. Um, and after the 10 presentations, we are going to have a hopefully lively conversation about what is today's public art. If anyone is on the Public Art Network listserv through Americans for the Arts, if you're not, I highly suggest you get on it. And one of the questions that was posed uh, last month actually was, what is, a what is the definition of public art? What is public art? And so I thought, how relevant, because I was already planning this. And so maybe we can come up with a definition to post onto the listserv from Greater Boston. And without ado, I guess is the uh, transition, I'd like to introduce Cher Krause-Knight, who is our moderator. She is the co-founder of Public Art Dialogue and an art history professor at Everson College. And she is going to be our ringleader. Yes. <laughs> Thank you, Cher. Thanks so much, Elise. Thanks to everyone for coming out tonight. I want to thank the artists. When Elise told me the concept for this, I thought it was fantastic. You know, the idea of getting a panoramic view of what's happening in public art in the moment. And we really have everything from a bronze sculpture to social interventions being presented today. So we are going to get that panorama. I think it's really important that we stick to the format. So I'll briefly just introduce people by name. They'll come up. Each person will do their three minute presentation. We're gonna ask everyone to hold questions until the end because the focus really is on spending our time in dialogue with you and with each other. So if questions come up to you during a particular person's presentation, jot them down, save them, we'll get there, I promise, okay? So without any further ado, I wanna start with our first speakers. It's actually uh, two artists working together, Elizabeth Billings and Andrea Wasserman, and turn things over to them. I'm uh, Andy. And I'm Elizabeth. Uh, we began working together almost 20 years ago. We came from different places but shared a similar aesthetic. The differences and the sharing have sustained our collaboration, as has a synchronicity often unspoken in our connection and our communication. <laughs> we have a lot of fun in the making of the work, and at the same time, we take this work very seriously. Art has presence, it can change lives and shift ideas. We have found ourselves awed by its profound ability to connect us to nature in a world where nature deficit is all too prevalent. We make work predominantly by hand, knowing that the sense of the hand is part of our connection. We carve, paint, stitch, draw, design, assemble, sandblast, weave. We uh, move art, uh, we pack art, we talk to a lot of people, and I can think about 200 other tasks that we do in a given day to make the work have lift off. And how we think about the work can make a place more of what it is. So all those pieces tie into how we do it. We willingly signed a contract this past March with City University of New York School of Law that included a completion deadline of August. Although we generally work quite hard, this schedule um, completely challenged our normal work ethic. We harvested saplings, fabricated panels, removed bark, designed a hanging system, um, mixed gallons and gallons of milk paint applied in layer after layer and wired hundreds of saplings all in three foot by seven foot sections, 28 of them. We had drawings and sketches and visualized the work clearly in our minds but never actually saw the work as a whole until we installed. That always calls for a sustained leap of faith and nurturing of any possible aspect of problem solving and then a very deep sigh when it eventually all comes together. And uh, Liz's studio is even smaller than mine. At least the drawings in this particular instance covered my entire studio all the way around. But um, very often we make big pieces that we can't 
The work gets a lot of direct natural light, the movement of the sun and the shadows of the course of the day are truly a part of the piece. The base layer of paint in combination with as many as five layers of saplings enhance the effect of the shadows and give the feeling of deep woods in a very urban environment. It is a bright, dynamic, and very quiet all at the same time. Though we've made large projects for universities, hospitals, and airports, this particular piece is one of the more visible, both from the atrium and also from the street. It was terrific to be chosen to bring our work to a diverse multicultural urban institution. We believed it would have significance when questioned by the dean at the interview, but it was really amazing to see the colors and trees in such density hold the space as it reflected back on the urban downtown of Long Island. Is, uh, is Lori Lobenstein from the Design Studio for Social Intervention. Lori? That was beautiful, you guys. <laughs> <laughs> um, my name is Lori Lobenstein. I'm one of the co-founders of the Design Studio. We're based in Roxbury, Massachusetts. We're a creativity lab for folks from social justice work. We bring together artists, activists, and academics to imagine and test new solutions for complex social problems. Um, we think artists are really critical to our work. Um, I'm an activist, and activists are pretty literal. Um, <laughs> and we get stuck in some old forms, and artists have helped us think about the symbolic, and particularly how symbols are used by communities, cultures, and people to make collective meaning. And so I'm gonna use one example of this, if we can show. Um, Let's Flip It is a campaign, we can go back one, or either way. Um, Let's Flip It is a campaign we worked on with young people who came to us and said we want to decrease violence among students. It's been a big issue, um, as you guys know. And they identified a symbol that had collective meaning for youth, and that was a logoed baseball cap. So a particular block or crew or gang would use a baseball cap to represent their block. And violence could ensue if they got on a bus and someone else was on the bus with a cap of an enemy crew or whatever. So they wanted to say, how do we, how do we live our lives? How can we say to each other, like, we just want to live. Let's flip this. Um, so we came up with them with the blank white cap. You can see this young man wearing it. And the symbol was, you know, we can, we can flip this and this is something that young people are going to say to each other. Um, one of the things that I also really love in terms of the, the knowledge that artists have brought us is the elegant gesture. The elegant gesture here was that youth wanted to say it to each other. It couldn't be a big billboard on a bus. If you saw, if a young person saw the Let's Flip It logo, it was on another young person. It was uh, the next slide, I think, Gorilla Style. We had stickers, we had buttons. So it was really about this being young people delivering it to other young people, because they said this has to be a horizontal approach. Um, I think that artists have brought us a lot in terms of the symbolic, in terms of the elegant gesture, and I want to, I think I'm getting close to time, I'm not going to go all the way into the public kitchen, but to say this is probably our biggest gesture yet in terms of a public, public installation. It's coming up in late October. Um, we've been working on it for about a year. We did some of it last year at Roxbury Open Studios. It's coming up for a week outside in the home's corner in October. Um, and it's really a gesture towards saying everything right now is being privatized. The public is being defunded, denigrated, and privatized. And we said, what if we went the other direction? What if we created a new public infrastructure, a place like a public library, but it's a public kitchen? And you could share and meet people and borrow, borrow a recipe book or learn a new thing to cook or go to a night night market and you know buy someone else's apple pie or hot sauce um, so that's coming up we'd love to have you join us and also we do art commissions it's one of the ways that we've learned and worked with artists so for the artists in the room um, if this is the kind of thing that interests you we'd love to, to talk more thanks so much <laughs>